When you're spinning round, things come undone. Welcome to Earth, third rock from the sun. Boy, there's never been a chorus line written. It can be better describe a typical golf swing than that right there. Secrets, mysteries, magics, and myths in the making of a good repeatable golf swing. Oh man. You want to talk about opening up a can of worms, ladies and gentlemen? A can of worms so large that it could hold all the mightiest python snakes throughout the entire world. Man, just start talking about golf swing secrets. Secrets, mysteries, magics, and myths. We're going there very shortly. We're going to get right to work. Last, first video, I talked about retaining good balance throughout the swing. I spoke of using your, your spine in reference to your centerline axis that you must retain. I spoke about retaining hips forward throughout the swing. I talked about playing golf on the insides of your feet. And I want to pick up on that just for a second. And then I'm going to set the second cornerstone. In your body, you have 24 vertebrae. At the bottom, you have the sacrum and then the tailbone below. I want you to notice that in many respects that that spinal cord and those 24 vertebrae are set up similar to a chain. This can create a chain action. That spine creates a chain action as well. When you retain your hips forward, that allows each one of these vertebrae to stay almost exactly positioned where they belong. If you allow your hips to slide laterally right, it has displaced every 24 of those beautiful cartilage. Moreover, as you would imagine, it's displaced all the coastal <coughs> cartilage as well, the rib cage, and with that, the shoulder joints, the hip joints, the knees, the feet. What you once thought was one swing fault by moving your hips towards the right, you now find that you have 206 bones dislocated out of position to where they should be during the execution of a good golf swing. That spinal cord and those 24 cartilage can function no different than this chain. This chain works as a single unit to create a chain action. The spine works as a single unit to create a chain action. It's that important and unless you're willing to try to work out the problems associated if you're still having them and you're moving these hips to the right unless you're willing to work on that I cannot help you unfortunately nobody can help you and and even worse off is you can't help yourself this is absolutely important you know if you are going to retain your centerline axis throughout the swing if you are going to swing the club on the insides of your feet and all the other things that go with it the spine will serves to work together with every other integrated procedure in golf to create a chain action maintain the spine maintain the chain action 
It's that simple. And with that explanation, you know just a little bit more about why things are so. Now with respect to our second cornerstone foundational block upon which we will continue to build as time moves on. Golf club manufacturers, some of the best companies in the world and the biggest, spent much money, big time dough, designing a precision made instrument. Maybe one of the greatest injustices of all in the whole world of golf is referring to its tool as a club. This is precision made, well balanced, fine tuned instrument. And in that respect, it has to be treated as such. The designers put this club together gave you a wonderful sweet spot down here in this nicely weighted head and the clubs are balanced to try to give you a complete set that may feel very 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 close to one swing weight and that's what you want to treat them like but you can't do that if you over control this club head either through the grip or anything else you want to do. Of course, anything you do will be transmitted to the club head through the hands. And everything the club does will be transferred back into the hands. You're cross-talking with this club head at all times if you pull it off correctly. From the minute that you pull the club from the bag, I mean the exact moment, you have to be begin accustoming yourself to the swing weight out here on the end of this nice shaft. You want to feel that and as, if you can feel it you can communicate with it through body feeling and that's what your job is to do. The designers put this club together so in fact it could create two true forms of circular motion. One with respect to the length of the shaft where is you're creating your arc and the plane but the other is to allow this club to return square through impact and then as it goes on in to the follow-through obviously the face gradually closes as your hands roll and carries the club up in, and your arms and everything up into a nice full follow-through. In this respect, I want to just talk briefly about centrifugal forces. Those forces which tend to work away from the center of rotation, obviously our spine in this instance. When a golfer gets up towards the top here and he throws and he hits down, this heavy weight associated with this swing weight wants to cast outward. And that obviously is the momentum forces working in connection with centrifugal forces that are throwing it in this direction. The, the radius or arc, the arc is being established by this radius point from here to here. Now, that's the one way that the engineers designed the club. Pretty simple there, of course. But it, that's not your problem. You can get the club back onto the ball. You cannot square the club face. That's your problem. Well, for 90% of golfers it is. But the designers also place this beautiful club head on this shaft in a manner where it is offset and this toe weight out here is also being affected by centrifugal forces during your swing. So when, when the centrifugal forces work on this, not only in an outward direction that way, but it's also trying to work to rotate this club back into a square position by impact. And it looks just a little bit like this. 
Hopefully you can pick up on that. But you see, this is a nice swing weight out here. But you can kill it through your grip. If you take a death grip on the club, or what's referred to as a motorcycle grip, you've already fired up the muscle chains in your body and your arms and stuff that's almost rendered your, that has rendered your golf swing for that stroke dead in the water. You must feel this swing weight out here. You must feel it and cross communicate, cross talk with it. From the moment you pull it through the, from the bag, you become accustomed to the swing weight. It becomes accustomed to you. You work as a team. Now, providing that you do not kill that cross communication through too strong of a grip, when you return back into the hitting area, the centrifugal forces will throw out from the center of its rotation right here, this beautiful axis right there. It will throw out from its center of rotation and square the club face for you. No fuss, no muss. And you don't have to worry about it. It'll take care of itself. Why? Because that's the way the engineers designed it. Now, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people with this big old motorcycle grip. Boy, they get their, they, they turn the, the left hand over and they get the right hand way under like that and that dress they might look like something like this. And I mean, you can just tell, you can see it in their forearms. The muscle chains are just, you can see it from 50 yards away that they're not going to do a very good job swinging that club, not for that pass. And when you fire up the muscles, on the outside of your forearms, <laughs> you're dead in the water. You know, you're going to come undone. Everything about you is going to come undone. You won't even be able to move. But anyway, here we go. The guy gets the setup, he takes a death grip, or he takes this big old motorcycle grip, and he gets to the top of the swing, he throws down, and he comes back around to here, and his, his body's all locked up. His body don't want to move no more. But this club head, the momentum of this club head, since momentum is always conserved, it has to go somewhere. So where does it go? He comes around like this. He, he does not, he, his body is locking up. His shoulders are realigning over his hips. So what is he, what happens? The club snaps past the hands. And the, and the left wrist breaks down and starts pronating. It goes into a pronation from a straight line where it should be here to pronation. And then the club comes up like this and his arms up in the air, sometimes all chicken winged. You've seen the chicken wings. Some people refer to it as pretzel shaping. The arms are pretzel shaping. So what is our second cornerstone? I bet you know. <laughs> you must retain the feelings for the swing weight of this club throughout the entire swing. The other thing I want to point out is there are some people that tell you that you should intentionally roll your hands over through the hitting area. Get down here Bring the right elbow back in like this. Bring the right elbow in. Come down here and intentionally roll your hands over through the hitting area. You're talk, when you re-enter the impact zone, you're working with milliseconds before club ball impact. There is no way that your mind can cross communicate with the sensors in your body and your muscle chains, or, or the other way, where the sensory receptors communicate with the brain. There is absolutely no way whatsoever that your brain can process that, those thinking habits so that you can try to repeat that intentional rollover of the wrist. There's no way. But let me put it this way. 
If someone has instructed you to intentionally roll your hands over through the hitting area, effectively what they told you is to throw all the beautiful design work of this club out the window. Throw it right out the window. When you hold on to this club and you're trying to apply this hitting, air, this heavy hitting roll over motion, your muscle chain just went to hell. You had stresses firing up that were not supposed to be firing up at that, at, at that delicate and devilish time in the golf swing. Let me finalize this conversation this way. If, you, if, if before you were instructed to roll your hands over, did you have a non-repeatable swing? And I would assume your answer would be, yes, I did. Now let me ask you, once you began rolling your hands over through the hitting area, do you now have a repeatable golf swing? And I would assume you would say, no, I don't. Case closed. If you're trying to roll your hands over through the hitting area, you're, you're, you're going against the work those great engineers and designers and quality control from some of the greatest companies in the world put into the design work of this precision made instrument, fully aerodynamic, and when it returns to the hitting area, if you're f feeling the weight of that swing weight, it'll close itself. Now, of course, down the road on some of our, our more advanced lessons, I'll tune those descriptions up a little bit. But for now, that's not your concern. You're trying to, to break down bad habits and instill good habits. And hitting, intentionally hitting with your hands would be equivalent as far as I'm concerned, to moving your hips to the right. There's no sense of having your first cornerstone if you're going to intentionally roll your hands over through the hitting area. It won't work. It, it, it just it will not do you any good. You will not build a kind of repeatable swing that we're talking about here to a point where you can go out on a course and know long before you get there that you'll have no problem whatsoever breaking 80. And where you take it from there, that's your, that's up to you. The second cornerstone. Where do we place our second cornerstone? In our pyramid of learning. Our pyramid of understanding. Where do we place our second cornerstone? Please answer. On this cornerstone, across the face of it, will be written... I will always feel the swing weight from the moment I pull it from the bag. And once you've written that on that cornerstone, walk over to the one that says I will maintain my hips forward and I'll retain my centerline axis. And take the one that you just made up to feel the weight of the club head and set it right dead on top of the other one. Set it right perfectly square. As a matter of fact, get yourself some blocks, some spray paint and tinsels, and write it on two cinder blocks. Dot, dot. Write it on it and stack them. And while you're stacking them, make every corner and every edge precisely fit. I do want you to know, I do appreciate you coming in here. I don't care where you're at in the world. I do appreciate it and also you are just learn a little bit more to start your climb up your ladder and you've learned a little bit more about the golf swing and why things are so. Thank you, God bless. Always keep on swinging.